few weeks. I've had a cough that's been trying to make residence in my body. It's not going to. But I notice there's several triggers that sort of sets it off, which I try to avoid. Even if I'm standing or sitting or sleeping, it's a trigger. If I inhale deeply or breathe shallow, it's a trigger. So I try to avoid all these. And, uh, mostly I do okay, but once in a while it gets me. Hallelujah. Oh, you know, I was thinking this morning um, that coming to church. If, if it's not different than any of the other social clubs in town, of which there are several, and obviously meeting a need because they've been growing for years. If, um, and I would even include the Friday Night Pub on that one. Um, you know, if, if church isn't somehow different than the other social clubs, um, What's the deal then? Like, what are we doing this for? <laughs> and uh, uh, anyway, I <clears throat> I advocate for uh, for doing what the church has been known to do and can do, and uh, and and what is capable of doing, and and that's that's bringing some kind of a reflection of the miraculous to the table, you know? Uh, would we have deep within us uh, a need to connect with God? Um, and depending on our journey that, you know, we all could be at a different place, but, but, <clears throat> but deep within there somewhere, there is a wanting to know who's out there, and uh, so that's one aspect of it. Another very great reality is that we come with needs, you know, we come with questions, we come with with hurts, we come with dis disappointments. We, like, like if we could tabulate every need and every disappointment, every hurt that's just represented here today, like, wow, it would be enormous, it would be enormous the amount of, of situations, needs, etc., that we represent. And, and so again, you know, the purpose of gathering, uh, it's kind of like when Jesus would do his thing. Needs were met, questions were answered, and, uh, and the miraculous took place, whether it was a very visible miraculous deal or whether it's something on the inside. So, so uh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's be there, let's go there, let's stay there. Let's, uh, let's be different than, than your regular social club. And, uh, and I'm not saying we aren't. I'm just highlighting the reality of what church uh, should be and uh, what we try to <coughs> cultivate here. Yeah. So I put somebody on the spot a minute ago. Is it a yes or a no? <laughs> Sounds like it's a yes. Wow, good for you. So um, the other week, right, we as a church, we did a prayer and fasting thing all week and then we um, sort of had a climax on Friday. And we had an amazing time of prayer here. And uh, we had people testify last Sunday of, uh, of their experience. And, and uh, Crystal was one that, that was a part of that Friday evening thing. And, and, and I'd even leave room for somebody else after Crystal is finished. Uh, if, if you want to come and speak of what that evening meant to you. Uh, so, and I know I'm putting you on the spot. You got more time than I gave her, so take your lead off of her. Thank you for being brave. Well, um, 
Jassy, I know that she gave her testimony last time. So that's why I feel she's giving me strength. So if she can do it, I can do it, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess a couple weeks ago um, when we had our prayer meeting, I didn't know anything about what baptism of the Spirit is or baptism by fire of the Holy Spirit. I knew that about water baptism and that I was baptized by water a couple of years ago. Um, and then it was a few people here that had told me about being baptized in the Holy Spirit, and Andrea was a big part of that. Um, and we had a few prayer meetings last year and, and um, at Abe's house, and we were meeting quite a bit, and that's where I learned more about it. Um, up until a couple weeks ago, I, I didn't know if it was for everybody. Um, I, gifts of the spirit i mean you hear about them in the bible and you hear about them happening to other people but um sometimes you wonder if it's for you um and i think sometimes not feeling worthy or whatever it is can stand in the way of receiving those gifts and um not that we are worthy but through jesus we are yeah. everybody's worthy through jesus. Yeah. And then, so I took the opportunity a couple weeks ago to join in the praying and fasting. And, and when I got here, I mean, I, wasn't ex I was expecting to pray. And, I, I, and that day I had prayed because it was on my mind and on my heart, um, as it has been for a while. Um, I said, if, if that's your will, um, just help unblock my heart, help me to get rid of whatever it is, search my heart, help me to overcome, to get rid of whatever it is that might be a block to receiving that. And, and when Pastor Dwayne came up and said, I want to pray for you, and he kind of described, explained a little more what, what it was about, of course, I was like, oh, I don't want to do this. Like, I don't want to, I, like, what if it doesn't happen and everybody's disappointed in me and because I've been there before and I'm not going to force anything. I just, you know, and um, and, and so I, I, I agreed. I said, okay, let's do this because I, I had been praying for it. I thought, well, let's do this. And and when I was praying for it, it's not, it's not that, um, it's not that there aren't tangible things in life that we that we see and look back on and think, wow, that was God. Like, there's so many things in my life that I know was God, like 110%. Mm -hmm. But there is something to be said for those undeniable manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still in shock. Like, I'm still looking back two weeks ago and thinking, what happened? Like, what through it in my head? Um, so we were we were praying, and I was just praying. I wasn't really expecting anything. I was just asking God to to help me through, and and um, and then all of a sudden, it wasn't my mouth praying anymore. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, it was pretty indescribable. Like I I, I had heard of it happening to other people, and I've heard people praying in tongues, and. Um, and it was just another language coming out of my mouth. Yeah, it was, it's, it's hard to describe. And I mean, it was, I don't know if anybody else even heard it. It was very loud in my head. <laughs> um, like it felt, it felt like my spirit was pleading with God. And it was an, an amazing feeling. And I'm, I just feel, even if it never happened again, I'm so glad that God gave me that, that experience. And so that I can, when, I can tell other people and, and I can look back on maybe in times where I'm discouraged and I can look at that and say, no, like he's with me, he loves me, mm -hmm. he's walking with me yeah. and yeah. yeah. And so that's yeah. the first testimony of anything I've ever shared. So <laughs> yeah. I think I have
amazing who can talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where does she live? Well, she's probably doing kids, but she was surprised me last week as well. Bless the Lord. Amen. So I did say I'd give somebody else another ticket to camp. Going once, twice. Sorry, you missed it. <laughs> <laughs> so today, I, I want to broach on a subject that um, I'm going to say it's controversial, perhaps. This depends, you know, where, where one would be at um, in their walk with the Lord or what they believe is scriptural or whatever. Um, and, and, and what I want to address is, is the whole issue of what we believe. And the title of my message is, Is it important what we believe? Yes or no? Is it important what we believe? So, that's the obvious answer. The next question is, what you believe, is it true? Is it biblical? Does it represent the, the very true heart of God? Does it represent the counsel of heaven? Does it represent what Jesus uh, did when he was here and what he accomplished when he was here and the the coming of the holy spirit what we believe does it represent this broad council uh, so <laughs> as i was putting this message together uh, i used to be involved in construction and uh, and if somebody wanted an addition on their house, the tricky part was putting an addition on so it looked like a part of the original structure and not just a pimple stuck on the pig snout. <laughs> and, and so when I'm putting this message together, I'm thinking, well, I sure hope this thing doesn't look like some kind of an addition onto something that it's got some continuity and that it makes sense. Hallelujah. So, is it important what we believe? The obvious answer is yes. What we believe, is it, is it the real thing? You know, in, in, in relationships, whether it's a marriage relationship or between friends, it's very important what we say either to the other person or we say about the other person. And this really shows up in marriage because you're kind of stuck together for a very long time, you know. It's not like you can go home. Um, and, and so in, in, in a relationship like that, <clears throat> it's so important what we say uh, to the other person or about them, because they will say, hey, that really hurts me when you say that, right? Or whatever. And so I think of our relationship with God, you know, like, you might be in a relationship with somebody and you think you know something about them or whatever and so you say something whatever and they're thinking well why do you talk to me or about me like that that's not who i am and and in my relationship with god or your relationship doesn't matter how deep or shallow our, our walk is with god i mean as, as long as it's sincere and so what we say about him, does he kind of say, oh, like, what's going on? Like, why do you talk about me like that? 
That's not who I am. So I want to take a run at some of this stuff. So if your seat belt ain't on, you might want to fasten it. <laughs> so I want to hit some of these things between the eyes. And, and, and I'm talking to Christians, and I might be talking to you, I'm not sure. If, if I'm not, just smile and nod your head vigorously, and people will know I'm not talking about you, it's somebody else. God's in control of everything. How many times have Christians, or have you heard that said? Well, God's in control. So if God's in control of everything, what about the two-year-old little boy that got driven over several years ago by his dad, accidentally? That's pretty bizarre if God's in control of that. Yeah. Or the dad who is practicing archery in his backyard lets an arrow fly the very moment his 12-year-old daughter comes running around the side of the house and he watches his daughter die in front of him. God's in control of everything. Probably not. Everything happens for a reason. Every well-meaning people say that. Well, everything happens for a reason. Knock on wood. <laughs> yeah, well, everything does happen for a reason. John 10.10 10 explains it very clearly. Jesus came to give abundant life, and the devil has come to kill, steal, and destroy. But if we're going to use that phrase, everything happens for a reason, we better explain who did it. Did the devil do it or did God do it? Is it abundant life or is it kill, steal, and destroy? Somebody is stricken with a severe illness, crippling disease, and they're passing out of this life is and looks horrible. And we say, well, God took him home. Excuse me. Excuse me. We better explain that one if we use that phrase. Do you mean that God used that illness to take somebody out of this world? That being the case, I think Jesus better come back and take another run at this thing. <laughs> My understanding of Isaiah 53 and the finished work of Christ is that he died to eradicate and deal with sickness and disease. <laughs> Another one is God puts governments in place. And if there's a government in place, that's God's will. <clears throat> when the Chinese Communist Party got put in place, I think in 49, how many people died as a result of that government in place. No one knows for sure because it's a closed country. It's between 40 and 80 million that die because of mass starvation, execution, labor camps, etc. When Stalin took power, it's estimated 20 million people die through mass starvation, intentional starvation, 
execution, and labor camps. It lurked. So do you still think that every government that gets put in place is God's will? That is so widely assumed that it is. When Hitler came to power, not only six million Jews in those concentration camps, five million non-Jews in those concentration camps. And the Second World War, between 70 and 85 million people died as a result of the Second World War. So, the scriptures that say we're supposed to obey government, the scripture that says that God's got the kings of the nations in his hand and he puts them in, he takes them out. Well, there's obviously something more to that picture than what we so easily and flippantly say. Oh. If our belief system is not well structured, well thought out, and well balanced, what we could communicate either to one another and, and more, uh, with, with much more fragility to the person outside who might be looking for answers, might be looking for the right religion, might be looking for the right God. If we don't have a proper belief structure, system, balance, in how we believe, which has a direct influence on how we speak, if, if this is not in order, we find ourselves speaking and uh, we, we talk about a God that is not the God of the Bible. We are, if, if you listen to people talk, when they talk carelessly or foolishly, they are talking about the God that Muslims worship and serve. Do the research on what Muslims believe and you will realize, wow, I think some Christians are thinking the same way they do and they talk the same way and they believe that, that this God and the Muslim God, they must be the same person. <laughs> and so it is with other religions. That, that we reflect, we can reflect, I should say, because we're not all guilty of this, and, and we're not in a bad way as a church family, but I'm going somewhere with this. Like I said, I don't want this to be a goofed up renovation job. Go track with me. You know, get this thing looking pretty fancy by the time we're done, with your help. So it's very important that what we believe and that we know the ways of God, we know the heart of God, and that what we say with our mouth, that it reflects the true way and will of God, and it doesn't reflect other gods that are out there. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. So, some of what I want to speak about today, if you haven't figured it out, is the sovereignty of God. And, <coughs> and it's indisputable whether or not God is sovereign. He's omnipotent, he's omniscient, 
He's only present. He's just, he just is. He just is. He's sovereign. In his sovereignty, he has uh, decided, that's a big word, he has decided to make humanity partners with him with respect to life here on earth. And to illustrate the point, we will look at four covenants that God has made with humanity. There's more than four, but we'll highlight four of them. Starting with Adam and Eve. And what I want us to notice is that all these covenants have, some, have a very strong similarity one to the other. So the first covenant was with Adam and Eve. And he said to them, be fruitful, increase the number, fill the earth to do it and have rulership. The second covenant was with Noah. And he said the same thing to Noah and his family. Same thing. The third covenant we want to look at is what he made with Abraham. Now the wording is different, but the end result is the same. So to Abraham, he says, your offspring will be like the, uh, like, like the stars. It'll just be such a multitude of people. It'll be like the stars. And that you will be a blessing to all nations. In Galatians 3, verse 7 and 8, it says very clearly that you and I, as children of God, are Abraham's seed. We are his children. We are his children. And even though we are not of, of the Jewish nation, we are of a different nation, but the promise to Abraham was, if you walk by faith and you do your part, the nations, and so we could have here Germans, Ukrainians, some other people, uh, whatever, uh, Swedish, uh, what are we? Like, we're from everywhere, and we're here this morning and we are of those nations that was promised to Abraham, if he does his part, the nations will be blessed. And here we are. The fourth covenant to look at is the one that Jesus uh, put in place, that he, what, what, with what he accomplished by his ministry, uh, death, resurrection, and ascension, here on earth and from earth. In Luke 22, verse 20, Jesus talking to his disciples on at the Last Supper, he says, I make a new covenant, it's in my blood. And what we are today, it's, it's like, God looked at, looked at the mess, looked at everything that has been transpiring, and in his mind he's saying, I'm going to start over. I'm going to start over. I'm going to take another run at this. And through Jesus Christ, and, and by him being the perfect Lamb of God, by shedding his blood, for the sacrifice of our sin, which we could not qualify to pay the debt of our sin, through what he did, it was like God said, okay, I'm just gonna start this thing over again. And, and it's, it's hidden in what Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not, will not 
Take this one down. Take this one down. Hallelujah. That's the fourth covenant. <clears throat> In all, well, no, we're not done with that covenant yet. Uh -huh. This is the sticky part. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20, this is where the rubber meets the road. That once again, like in all these other covenants, there is an agreement between God and mankind that he will do his part, we will do our part. There is no such thing that God will do his part or have something to do here that does not involve mankind. Can you think of anything that happened that what God did in, 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 in a large way that was not prophesied out of the Old Testament? Now you didn't come prepared to answer that question, but think about it. Is there anything that has ever happened that, that man was not used to say this is going to happen? Well, that's weird. Like, does God need permission to do something that we have to say, okay, God, you can bring Jesus here. You can bring a Savior. We're ready now. Whether that question deserves an answer or not, I'm not sure. But it does appear, it does appear that God will do something or that everything God does has been talked about by a human being. And in this scripture, it, it, it reads in the Passion Bible so beautifully, so beautifully. And that's not that translation. But, but it just so beautifully says that, that God pleads through our lips tenderly to those who are without, to those who are on the outside. God needs us. God needs us. God needs us. And what we believe determines what we say. And those four or five items I listed earlier, like there's probably dozens of little belief systems that we carry about. What we believe will determine what we say. Huh. And here's God trying to speak through us because we're in a partnership with him. He isn't doing something here that we're not a part of. We're in a partnership with him. And he wants to speak through us. And he can only speak through us. This is how it's designed to function. This is how it works. We, the church, he speaks through us. <laughs> and if we believe the wrong thing, we're going to say the wrong thing. And I can see God standing back and saying, well, wait a minute. I'm in this relationship with you, but that's not who I am. That's not who I am. So I have in my mind three pictures of 
of the ideal of if, if God were idealistic or if we want to look at humanity and the creation of God from an idealistic perspective it would be like this so the first ideal would be in the Garden of Eden before sin entered the picture it was it had to be an amazing place. It is, yeah, most unusual, most amazing, most amazing. And that obviously was God's ideal, that it was just so amazing. If you can imagine a world without fear or confusion, or anger or bitterness, or, uh, <laughs> like, wow, crime, and I don't know. If, if you can just imagine a world without all this stuff, that's what it would have been like in those early days or years, however long it lasted. The second ideal, and, and obviously that picture was free from illness, free from disease, free from uh, all health issues. There was no such thing as a health crisis. The second ideal is when Jesus had his ministry here on earth. It, it, it's very clear <clears throat> that that if you saw Jesus, you saw the Father. And Jesus even said that. He said, if you see me, you see the Father. Jesus also said that I don't do anything I don't see my Father doing, or I don't say anything I don't hear him saying. So Jesus was God on earth, if, if you will. Jesus was heaven on earth. Jesus was how it was on earth before sin entered the world. <coughs> when, when he came on a sick person, he never once said, oh, uh, no, you deserve this, buddy. You're on your own. Not, not once did he ever refuse to heal somebody. Not once was he ever incapable of performing the most miraculous feat from extending a withered arm to raising somebody from the dead. That's quite a high ideal. And then Jesus says, Father, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Like, wow, that's shooting so high. That's quite an ideal. And obviously the third ideal is heaven itself. Is there sickness in heaven? Is there all the human issues like anger, bitterness, envy, lust, uh, like that big long grocery list of stuff? Is, is that stuff in heaven? Obviously not. So this is God's ideal for the human race, for us here on earth. So is it important what we believe? 
Is it important what we believe about human issues, whether it's emotional, psychological, physical, health issues? Is it important that we try to understand from God's perspective what he thinks, what his ideals are, The way we believe is how we will speak. So let's carry on. In Matthew 13, verse 17, Jesus is talking to his followers. And he says to them, you know, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of very godly, godly people who long for the day when the Messiah would come and the next chapter would begin. In 1 Corinthians 13, 11 and 12, Paul says, and he used the example of a mirror in that day. Obviously, they didn't have mirrors then like we do now. And, and I only assume that because I never read about women wearing makeup in those days. So, but the mirror in that day, it was just polished metal, best they could do. But it wasn't like a mirror is today. So he says, it's kind of like we're trying to figure out the ways of God and understand the big picture, but it's like looking into this mirror. We just don't get a very clear reflection. In our day today, and, and I use the, the example of how it was in Jesus' day, when he said there were so many people, godly people, who longed for this day. And that day happened. That day, the coming of Christ, it did take place. My question to us today, <clears throat> with regard to what, what we don't see fulfillment of, Is it possible <clears throat> that, that it's similar to how it was in Jesus' day when he said, you know, there were so many people who believed and they did the little things right and here we are today. Voila. So in, in Jesus' day, just... Come with me with your imagination for a moment. So Jesus is born at the end of what is referred to as the 400 silent years, when there was no expression of a prophet or, or, or such a person who could rise and, and to the nation of Israel and say, hey, God is telling me this, come and listen. 400 silent years of just wilderness with respect to the voice of the Lord. Because Israel was in a backslidden state. But in that state, we have a Joseph and a Mary. And their mom and dad, their parents. And the angel comes to Mary and says, hey, you're a chosen one. And he comes to Joseph. Where did Joseph come from? And his mom and dad. And then they take Jesus into the temple. And there's a prophet, Simeon. Simeon 
Israel is in a terrible place. And you are a man of God. And Simeon says, I know who this little boy is. As a matter of fact, God told me I would not die until I laid my eyes on this baby, the Messiah. And in the midst of that excitement, a prophetess, Anna, shows up. She's obviously drawn to the excitement. <laughs> 84 years old. And she lays her eyes on this little baby and says, the savior of the world, we've been waiting for you. This is my point. In the midst of this darkness, 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 backslidden condition, there were people who believed, who partnered with God and believed and believe. They partnered with God and believe. Against all odds, they believe. And so, here we are today. We call ourselves believers. And we are, to whatever degree, depending what we believe. What about the prayers that we pray? And it's like, well, what happened? There was no answer. I've learned that the deeper you get in God, the more you get to know God. The deeper and heavier and the more abundant your questions. I have questions I've never asked anybody. I've had prayers like many of us here. You pray and you just feel such an unction that this is the will of God. <laughs> and it backfires on you. It doesn't happen. And if we tabulated the list of such experiences, it would be long and grievous. And it would wreck this meeting for sure because of how grievous it would be. <laughs> I believe with all my heart that God wants every person healed of every conceivable and named illness. Just like these people in the 400 silent years believed with all their heart that a Messiah was coming and they did not live to see that day. That part of the mystery, I will leave with God. But I believe with all my heart that the, the work that Jesus accomplished and finished through his death, resurrection, ascension, the coming of the Holy Spirit, that that addresses every need known to man. Why it does not happen? We could ask these prophets, these men of, these holy men of God who believed and believed and believed that the Messiah would come and they never saw it. Let's conclude it in this way. When a revival happens, that the many revivals that, that are recorded that have taken place, in that presence of God, in, in that, that expression of the glory of God, that very intense presence or glory, or however you would want to explain that, or describe it. In, in, in that atmosphere, nothing 
is impossible. Nothing. Read the accounts of these revivals. Nothing is impossible. The most bizarre, incredible healings. Incredible healings. Incredible healings. In Habakkuk 2, 14, we've looked at this verse previously, that in the end days, there will be a knowledge of the glory of God. And this knowledge will cover the earth. In the same way that all of us know somebody who was touched through the pandemic. Somebody of our circle passed away. Somebody of our circle got the virus. Just like this knowledge is not just in our midst, it's around the world. Everybody has a knowledge of what this thing did. There is coming a day when everybody <clears throat> will have knowledge of somebody touched by the glory of God. And there is coming a day when the fulfillment of what Jesus did, that we are going to see that in, in a way that can only be demonstrated through a manifestation of this kind of presence of God. And we will, if we don't see it, the ones behind us will. And if they don't, the ones behind them will. In the meantime, we will continue to believe. We will continue to believe. Just imagine if these prophets and holy men of old would have said, ah, to hoot with this, I'm done. I'm done. And we never would have had the parents the grandparents who produced the parents of Joseph and Mary. Or Elizabeth. Or Simeon. Or Anna. Let there be a people who believe against all odds and not throw in the towel when it doesn't happen or come up with concocted ideas and doctrines as to why it doesn't happen anymore because it never happened. <laughs> I believe in the finished work of Christ. And just like, like all of our belief as Christians comes out of the Old Testament, so there are other scriptures in the Old Testament that are not fulfilled yet. And Habakkuk 2.14 is one of those scriptures. And there are others who suggest very strongly that there is going to be a wrap-up party one day and there will be a presence of God on the earth that is going to impact earth to such an extent that the promise given to Abraham that his followers will exceed the number of stars in the sky. Huh. And the knowledge of this will cover the earth. Everybody is going to know. Everybody. And nobody will be without excuse. Hallelujah. Include my renovation. Another pile of more sitting here untouched. But I think I made my point.
Is it important what we believe? Lord, count me worthy. Count me in, in the same group as those prophets of old who against all odds and in dire conditions believed. Hallelujah. And out of their believing, a strain was kept alive. And the conclusion of that strain was a precious girl, Mary, and a husband, Joseph, and a prophet, Simeon, and a prophetess, Anna, and an Elizabeth, and a Zechariah. Wow. That I could at least be in the shadow of such great men and women of God. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, I just pray that. I just beg God that your church could be alive be a place of hope and healing and that we would learn your ways guard them in our heart cherish these thoughts and only let truth and life come up across our lips that we could portray a God who is love, who does have our best interests at heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is my prayer, Lord. This is my prayer. Thank you, God. So, Lord, as we look down the course of this year and the challenges that we know lie ahead and the ones that will take us by surprise we arm ourselves with a balanced healthy belief system that allows you to be Lord and allows us to fall into our rightful place and pick up our task and do our job. Hallelujah. And great will be that day when the knowledge of your glory is on the lips of everyone around the world. Around the world. So Father, I bless these good people. And our family that isn't here this morning, that bless them as well in Jesus' name. With health and safety, wherever they are. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. I pray for a good week for all. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be blessed. Hallelujah. Be blessed.